Um, our next talk, I love this, project management for engineers. Um, this is something I had to do. And now I'm going to be fascinated to learn all the things that I probably did wrong. Um, so please give it up for Michelle Brenner. Good morning. So I'm Michelle, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix. So I'm sure your first question is, why is an engineer doing a talk on project management? Here's why. Everyone, no matter their job title, likes to know they're doing the right thing. They don't want to be wasting their limited time. They want to know that this is the correct project, feature, or bug to prioritize right now. This work will have the most impact whether you measure that in sales or uptime or stakeholder delight. We also want to be reliable. A manager once told me he liked it. When I said I would get something done, I got it done. Uh, that really stuck with me because I didn't realize that was unusual, that other people don't plan all their tasks and then add lots of breathing room for the unexpected. I also like to document my work to prepare for whatever is coming. Are you looking for a new job or promotion? Do you have an upcoming performance review? Is your company doing a reorg and you want to ensure your team survives? It's good to be proactive so you're not scrambling to remember what you did six months ago. It's like hardening your system before your attack. Don't wait until they're at the door to build the moat and don't wait to build your documentation for when they're asking why does your team exist. I've been working in tech for about 12 years now. The more I leveled up, the more ambiguous requests I would get. So early in my career, I'd get things like, here's the bug, or here's the feature. When the user does this, this happens, please fix this. Now it's more like using your expertise, decide what needs to get done next. What is the next big project? How are you going to do it? Without using project management tools, I would be totally floundering. I leveled up my personal project management skills with my engineering skills but I didn't share them with the team. And then a year ago, I looked around at my team and realized we weren't doing things the same way. I'd seen this kind of repeatedly in my career when a skilled team don't have the output they could have by just having this streamlined, organized process. And then since it went so well, I put this talk together. So where to begin? I started with building team consensus. No one likes to hear, hey, you're doing your work all wrong, but don't worry, I'm here to fix it. And just do everything I say without questioning me. That works really well, right? So it's, if there's anything that will lead to stonewalling, it's thinking you can come in and set everything right without compromise, uh, consensus. Ever since, especially since I don't have a manager's like official power, um, even if I did, I would follow the same process because we're all professional adults and top-down directives rarely work except to create malicious compliance. So the first step is getting everyone to agree that there is a problem and then what that problem is. No one will try a new process if they think everything is going great, even if it's not the perception from the outside. It's important to bring the team together and focus on the same root cause. That won't happen if they're busy blaming other people or teams instead of the process itself. So I presented the problem as I saw it. I asked the team, do you agree this is the problem? If they tried to veer into a solution, I cut it off. In this case, we narrowed it down to perceived lack of progress. We all knew our team was working hard, but it felt like we weren't getting a lot of output, especially to our stakeholders. So how do we change that? So when you open the floor for solutions to a problem, you'll get so many ideas. Everybody has ideas. Since it's Harder to quantify a correct process solution, like a technical problem, it's easy to get lost in theory. Like, oh, I think it should be done this way, I think it should be done this way, without running code to see if something works. However, the only way to really know a process will work is to just try it. Will people follow them in process, or is the administrative work too burdensome? Will it actually solve the problem? I made sure to listen to my team, but instead of doing a lot of back and forth, either in a meeting or with a drawn out feedback process, I asked for a trial. Let's just try something new for one quarter for three months. If we don't like it or want to tweak it, we can do it when we have actual data on this is how it went, either good or bad. The other important thing to note is to not try too many things simultaneously, like any good scientific experiment. 
even if, if you have identified more than one problem or have big ideas, I, I think about it like a code change that's gotten too big and no one can review it. You know, you want small incremental changes so people can easily digest them and slowly change their behavior. Another thing that's going to happen here is you're going to need to do some glue work. If you're unfamiliar with the term, right after this talk, during our break, you need to watch the entire presentation by Tanya Riley. It will change your perspective on work. A quick summary is that glue work is the administrative work that keeps the team moving well. The downside is it can be tedious, unappreciated, and take away from your technical growth. I have a couple of tips to prevent that here as you're trying to improve the team. While project management isn't the first thing someone thinks of as a technical skill, it actually is extremely valuable to your company. You will increase your team's velocity so your company can do more things. That should be a big highlight when working on your next job or promotion. Next is to make it as easy for yourself as possible. So I have a confession. I love organizational tools. I can't get enough of Evernote or Airtable or Notion. I just love them so much. I've spent, even spent too much time finally learning how to use Jira. I just want to make everything pretty with different colored labels and full automation and make it totally perfect. However, this can take a lot of time when your process is in flux. Instead, I push down my natural instincts and just use the Google Doc. Easy to edit, easy to share, can get as messy as it needs while we figure things out. Like making an app, just getting the features working, then you can make it pretty. So one step that can be missed in a planning a process is the migration plan. I've seen it happen when people have this great idea for a change, but no one manages to make the transition without a migration plan. The old process just drags on indefinitely, and no one actually changes. They just say, oh, this is the great new idea. We'll do that when we're done this, and that never changes. And then we have a great new idea six months later. So how do you wind down what you're doing gracefully so the new process can actually be started? In my team's case, I had everyone write a super short summary of all the in-flight projects, every single thing they were working on. I had them include a stopping point for each project that they could get done in the next one to two weeks. I also had them include a mini proposal of what would happen next if they could continue. In any project, it's good to find a spot where you can stop and say, at this point, it's good enough to get feedback. At this point, it's good enough to share. And then you reevaluate your future plans. You can then take all those what do we do next ideas and use them for our first exercise. So this is the impact effort matrix. The y-axis is impact and the x-axis is effort. This will help you visualize what's important. We've done it in person with actual sticky notes and a whiteboard, or you can do it virtually with any collaborative app. Or you can just draw two arrows on a presentation board like this. There are, there are lots of options for virtual. Um, I like Google Jamboard, or we've used Miro. That's been helpful, but there's, there's tons of options. Um, you can also Google impact effort matrix, and there's like a ton of them. You can just download them. So first, you want to give everyone time to write out every project or task in, as kind of a two to three word summary each on an individual note, so all these little project ideas on my fake sticky notes. They all go into a big pool. Then you can do a round of quick deduplicating before letting them choose what bucket they go into, because everyone might be thinking the same thing and we're all write the same thing with slightly different wording. So you want to just have a clear list of here's all the project ideas we have. So the four corners are the high impact, low effort, high impact, high effort, low impact, high effort, and low impact, low effort. This is kind of a deceptively simple exercise because not everyone has the same mental model of, of impact and effort and what they mean. I call it just like a feelings exercise rather than a data-driven data decision-making. I tell them not to think too hard on the first pass. Don't think about how long it might take or that type of thing in terms of like exact hours or days. Just, just the important part is that it drives the discussion of how you're feeling about this project. So when everyone is done, I start the discussion at high impact, low effort. The first mistake people usually make is thinking something is low effort. So I ask the person who put it there, is it really low effort? Can you get this task entirely done in, say, two weeks with one to two people? If yes, it stays. If not, I say, this sounds like high effort, high impact. 
we can either move it over or rewrite it with a smaller scope. I like to look for, is there like a single research or design task that we can kind of pull out of this and say, hey, this is the, this is the low effort task we can do to prove whether we should continue to work on this feature and help us figure out the scope of the rest of the project. Can we do like a wireframe demo or just like a really messy feature just to see if it works? Then that, that feature can say in the high impact, low effort for the next quarter. I really like proving out projects this way with small tasks first. So we have, then we have the data to make those data driven decisions if we want to make a more significant resource investment and then it's less, you know, our feelings. When the high impact tasks are all moved to their appropriate effort squares, I then question their impact. Will this actually have a high impact? Sometimes users complain about something a lot, but it's not actually something that happens often. They just like to complain a lot about it. Um, for example, something that wastes 30 seconds once a month versus something that happens every single day. Not that these can be ignored, but it's good to label them correctly so you know how to prioritize of what is actually the high impact. It could be, you know, the customer might, might, or the stakeholders might see one thing, but there's actually something happening in the back end that's causing a ton of work and would be a huge impact if we fixed it, and we want to think about those things. Um, it can also be informative, not just to think about the impact it would have if you complete it, but what would the impact be if it is never done? What is that negative impact? What are those things we're not going to do? So for the low impact, low effort, it's good to mix these things every once in a while, especially if it buys goodwill with your stakeholders. It's kind of a quality of life issue. It's not preventing everything from working, but it's nice to have. I think about it like your basement door constantly squeaks when you open it. It doesn't stop you from using the basement, but it is super annoying. And then the day that like you open the door and it doesn't squeak anymore, how like happy are you? Like it didn't prevent you from enjoying your basement, but it did like really irritate you. It's a good feeling. So for the low impact, high effort, just throw those away. Those go right into the trash. Uh, these will suck up your time without actually being good for the product or the stakeholders. I call these thankless tasks. I would just make sure there aren't secretly high impact. Sometimes things like tech debt or security updates can be seen as like a low priority when they're not like flashy. But with time, that like lack of progress can have a high negative impact. So that like opposite, like we don't do these, it'll be a bad impact. So just think about it. But there's some things that like you think like, oh, this will be a cool thing to do. But if it doesn't have high impact, we don't want to do them because it's going to waste so much time and you're not going to get the kudos that you want. So at the end of this exercise, your team should have a nice list of tasks. Now it's time to talk about stakeholders and actually prioritizing those tasks. It can vary between teams and companies, but I like to think of stakeholders as kind of three different levels. The first level is management. This is anyone from right above you to the C-suite. They can be also product managers who set broad direction but are not involved in day-to-day -day work. They're the ones that can give you the broader business context and division goals, or they could be clients, things like that. These can be things that we want to focus on, like, here's, here's what we want to focus on, like revenue growth or, or user acquisition or cost savings, things like that, like the broad business ideals. These stakeholders don't necessarily need to know all the technical details of what you're doing, but they still want you to prioritize all their needs. So for them, I take the list of projects and group them by their expected impact like user acquisition. Then I set those groups by the priorities the stakeholders have set. It shows these stakeholders that you've heard their contacts and are applying it. Also, if a team decides to work on something that's not a management priority, they should be prepared with a justification when management says, hey, this isn't for cost savings or revenue growth. Why are we, why are we working on it? And then it helps to explain it to them for things like, you'll have a very technical thing that you need to do, and you can explain like, oh, the reason why we're doing this is user acquisition, but like you don't really need to know all the details of why we're doing this very technical thing. So the seventh, 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 the second level of stakeholders are your technical partners. These are the teams you need to collaborate with to get actual larger projects done. It could be your DevOps or your security or your designers or your engineers. They all have their priorities, but you need to fit yours with theirs. 
For them, I provide more technical information about what we're doing and why. Then I ask if they have any needs from our team that weren't covered, or if there are any priority adjustments that need to be made. I always make it clear I'm working off the business priorities, but can tweak if there's an urgent blocker. The third level are our users. These are the primary users of your service or product or your this could be anything from the general, pub, the general public to other engineers in your company. If possible, I like to get direct feedback and ensure we're not missing any significant points because no one has spoken up yet. Depending on whether they're external or internal users, I might not be able to give them a lot of information about what's coming, but I can at least listen. It's nice with internal users, you can say, here's actually what we're doing. With external, they just get to be surprised when the basement door stops squeaking. So there are a few things I like to keep in mind when talking with all of my level of stakeholders. The first is setting clear expectations. This is the reasonable amount of work we can get done in this time frame. If you want something else, we will have to deprioritize another task. If everything is priority, nothing is. The second is constantly communicating changes. People are less likely to get mad if something's gonna be late or changed if they know a month in advance. Rushing to pretend everything is all good will hurt your team in other ways. People are mostly professional and reasonable, so it's better to sunshine changes early. For the technical stakeholders, it never hurts to explain the whole problem. People can get frustrated if they think something as easy is not getting done, and just giving them more information on the challenges can kind of smooth that over. If they're unfamiliar about your technical work, but you're like, here's laid it all out, they'll be like, oh, that seems hard, and then they like back away slowly, and they're like, it's okay, get, back, get it done when you get it done. So let's do the next exercise. So this is one of the challenges we experienced was not getting clear information from our stakeholders. I, the I theorized that we were asking for too much by having a blank page and asking them to fill it in. So I turned it around on them. I brought a list of projects to them and let them vote. This way, they had something to start the conversation. And this is kind of how it looked, really simple. This is literally just in a Google Doc. The list of projects we got done in approximately a quarter. We had short descriptions of the project and kind of a list of artifacts that we, these artifacts kind of varied on the project. They could be similar to a KPI or, or like a data goal. So like something like, oh, let's speed up the landing page by 50%. Or it could be something like a demo. So be able to show this feature to these stakeholders, like just something that we're driving towards and when we're done, we'll be able to show something. Then I gathered representatives from each stakeholder team and said you get three votes each to just put their names under the project. They're most important to their team. Uh, one of the things there is important in that you don't want everyone voting, you don't want 30 people voting. You want to say, hey, your team has these needs one person on your team gets to vote, and if you have anything, you need to tell that person. Because, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting with 50 people all with the same, all feeling like they had to talk, but it doesn't get any prioritization done because it just keeps going and going. So when I did this the first time, I was really worried there'd be a spread of votes across all the projects. And it would really not help decision making because people wanted different things. In reality, given the complete list, most people just voted for the same thing, which is really helpful. Then I was able to say, great, you all voted for these two things. These are the two things we're going to do this quarter. I'll, I'll keep you posted. So now that we have the big, the big planning, let's talk about kind of the continuous planning, that like weekly, bi-weekly project planning. Every team I've been on has, has done this like slightly different. And instead of focusing on the details of solutions, such as having two week sprints, or uh, I like to set goals and keep the process really flexible because everyone has ideas on the team and they're gonna be doing this so frequently, you really want your team to be committed to this process and like really enjoy it as much as you can enjoy uh, project planning. So first I try to make it as simple as possible with really low administrative overhead. If there are lots of meetings and work to manage all this documentation, moving things in and out of JIRA or doing all this wild stuff that takes away from solving actual technical problems. It also means that people just won't do it. I, you know, I've done this in the past where I'm like, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to label things like this, blah, blah, blah. And people are just like, nah, like this sounds good. And then like a week later, they just stop doing it. Um, so you want it as easy 
as easy as possible to do the right thing. And the minimum amount of tasks to actually uh, produce some improvement in the process. So when, and then when people get used to like that one change, then you can start to add like more. You know, it's kind of the, the lobster in the pot, like, oh, I really like this, maybe I'll try this. And then suddenly like a year later, it's like totally different and your big vision is complete. And they didn't even realize they've been changing all along. So the next, the next goal I set is making all the work transparent. It should be easy for anyone on the team to see what anyone else is doing. There should be no secret undocumented work. If work is reprioritized, it should be clear what had to be pushed and this helps with kind of two goals. If you can quickly see how much work the team and individuals are doing, you can see if they've taken on too much or have taken on too little. Predictable velocity to, to me is picking up a reasonable amount of work for a given amount of time and finishing most of it. You don't want to have lots of spare time, be frantically trying to finish, or constantly pushing tickets from week to week with like no end in sight. Um, and then by having transparency, it's clear when the team has this kind of last in, first out mentality, if they're constantly being derailed by new requests and not actually able to finish any of their planned work. This can be really demoralizing and also lower velocity because there's a huge cost to constantly changing tasks and not finishing the thing you're working on. The other problem that transparency can solve is siloing or only having one person be an expert in one area. So, Siloing is two bad things at once. If this person leaves, no one else knows how to fix those things. And that person is definitely going to leave because they've only been doing one thing and that it gets super boring. So it's two bad things. People who are excited about technology want to stretch and learn new things. It's better to know when people are starting to gravitate to the same areas and kind of nudge them to try other problems or join other teams or do just do slightly different things so we can keep things mixed up. So I would never prescribe have this length sprints or meetings every Tuesday or anything like that. I would instead look at your current practice and say, are these goals being met? Do you know what everyone is working on? Do you, is there like, is there transparency? Is it easy to understand it and know what's going on? And if not, how can I change things to, to meet these goals? What things can we try? So, I do the longer planning at the beginning of every quarter, and then I do a review at the end of the quarter. A quarter is a long enough chunk of time that the work looks really impressive. It also means I only have to do it four times a year. Uh, I have noticed that many teams will skip any sort of review and just start the next project. There are a few reasons I think this is a missed opportunity. First, there is team morale. Work can seem pointless if it's just an unending stream of tickets without stopping to just celebrate and really show, hey, this is what I've done. They'll think, why am I working so hard? What impact am I having? Pausing to look at everything a team accomplished can reinvigorate them for the next chunk of work. You don't necessarily need a pizza party, just acknowledging the hard work of the last quarter, but also a pizza party doesn't hurt. Who doesn't want pizza parties? Just Uber eats it to them and everyone's remote. So, Second, you can check in and say, are we on the right track? Are we doing impactful work? Were we able to get done what we said we'd get done? And if not, why? I like to focus on issues with the process here instead of like on individuals. I would ask, did we take on too many last minute requests? Instead of asking, John, why didn't you do any work this quarter? If John didn't do any work and your process has transparency, you can see that and it should be addressed privately and not, you know, it's part of the team, team discussion. The third is showing off the management. Showing off can have like this bad connotation, but I think of it as providing context to management. I always want to make things easy for any level of management. Make it easy for them to see how great my team is and easy for them to make decisions that go in our favor. I don't want them to wonder I don't know what this team does. Maybe we don't need them. Instead, they should think, wow, that team is so productive. They're a real asset to the company. That's the good team brand. Finally, there is that career resilience. I have like this whole separate talk about this, but I'm going to just summarize here. Resiliency is about being ready to explain what you've been working on and the impact you have at any time. 
As I kind of mentioned earlier, you never know when you're going to find a new job quickly, but you do know you'll eventually have a performance review. Having all your accomplishments, all your accomplishments already documented means you are ready for it whenever it comes. You'll notice that these reasons include something for everyone, something for the individual, something for the team, and something for management. The same task can rarely be a win for every group. It's also great for people who don't want to do this because it's extra work and not fun like solving technical problems. You can convince them by appealing to their altruism, by saying, it's for the team, or appealing to their selfishness and saying, it's for you, it's for your career growth. So either way, you can get them to do it. So now that I've gone over the why, let's do how do we do these. At its heart, end of quarter reviews are marketing reports. For anything that involves marketing, you should put your audience first. What information do they want? What do you want them to know about you? What do you want them to feel about your team? To answer these questions, I go back to the stakeholders. Each group will be different in what you want them to know and what they want to know about you. Let's start with the users. They just want to know about cool new features and how to use them. They're my primary audience for a newsletter. This uh, newsletter can be an internal email with a heavy ratio of pictures and GIFs to words. People mostly skim newsletters, so it's better to show the work as much as possible. The goal is to show off new things that users can try with links to any other documentation or instructions they might need. This can go to the broadest possible interested audience and also shouldn't have any in-depth technical details. It should focus on the user stories at, that they have and how they impact the business. What, what can they do now that they couldn't do before and how is it helping? The next stakeholder I focus on is management. For them, I wanted to paint a picture of all the hard work we're doing in a verbose mode. They just don't get the newsletter, but also all the details. While we can send a list of tickets, it's not as impactful as writing out success statements. If you've heard of success statements before, it's most likely because you've seen me do another talk about this, which is great because that means I have fans. So that's fantastic. But otherwise, I'll explain it. So success statements are short, easy to read sentences that describe a specific accomplishment. They're designed to highlight the impact of the success first and then how it was accomplished. It should be high level enough that anyone internally can understand and be impressed by it. Some tasks are easier than others to translate and can take time to get good at them, but it's a really helpful skill to be able to communicate to management in their language, in the language of business. So they should be similar to a resume point, resume bullet point, around 100 to 200 characters. It's always great if you can show impact in cost savings or profit, but time can also work since salary is a considerable expense. Accomplishments like increased sales or reduced storage costs would be a direct monetary impact. At the same time, save a coworker 30 minutes a week by automating a task is an indirect financial impact through salary and increased productivity. So I don't include all of these as part of the newsletter because it can be too much information. But instead, pick out highlights or merge similar ones to make big accomplishments. So here's kind of this, the, the framework of it. I improve this thing by this measurable amount using this method. I added a new way for customers to find us, increasing sales by 15% by connecting with a third-party API. So I improve this thing by this measurable amount using this method. I, it, can be, it can be difficult to get in the rhythm of using that framework. So I always have it at like the top of my screen, the framework, and as I'm writing them, and I always go back and forth and say, hey, does my success statement line up with this framework? Did I actually show a measurable amount? And if I don't have a measurable amount, how do I get a measurable amount? Like where can I find those numbers? Uh, when sharing this management, People often overestimate what they can get done in a day and underestimate what they can get done in a month. It's kind of amazing to see what a whole team gets done in a whole quarter. You take this huge list of success statements and kind of summarize, and you're like, wow, look at all the huge things that we've done. Like I've seen it in my team, it's been like two to three pages of all the stuff that we've gotten done. So now that you've started using your project management skills from conception to prioritization 
to review. The next step is making sure you're not doing all the work because you're not a project manager, you are the technical person. So something I've noticed kind of time and time again, both in my career and socially, is that so someone will be really passionate about something, they will build a book club or spearhead a new project, and it'll be super successful, people will love it, everyone will go, and then they're like, you know, I'm kind of tired of doing this, and they move on, and it completely falls apart. It just disappears very quickly. So the last thing we want is for you to do all this hard work to fall apart when you get your well-deserved promotion or your next job. So the first thing I did after we started doing this is write an SOP or a standard operating procedure. SOP is a common business tool to document processes. It's a living document as processes get adjusted over time. I, I like to order it by time. And then here are some examples. So like week nine, schedule the quarterly review. Week 10, get that stakeholder feedback. Week 11, remind the team to fill in their success statements because they probably didn't do it all quarter. And then week one of the next quarter, send out your previous quarter newsletter and have that done. So the way I put it up here, they're really short because I don't want to put too much text on the presentation, but they should be as verbose as possible when you put in the SOP. It should be like, who should be in the meeting? Who's included? What teams? What specific people? Is there an agenda for that meeting? Is there a template that you can copy over every quarter? So, and then as you write up everything you did, you'll find room for automation. For example, say you have a meeting that can be, you know, that you know you're going to have every 12 weeks, you can just schedule that in perpetuity and say, hey, here's the people, here's the agenda. Every 12 weeks, we have this meeting. Or something like, hey, every in the quarter, I generate a JIRA report to get people some data to help them with their success statements. This can all be automated. And that you'll see what can be automated once you write everything down. It'll be much easier. So the next step is identifying, identifying other team members who can help now and not just pick it up after you leave. Reading an SOP and trying to follow it with no backup can be daunting, so it's good to have them shadow while you're still there. Then they can try leading themselves while you're there to answer questions and fill in any gaps you might have missed in the SOP. And then they can take it over and you can just feed without having to do all the work. It's great. So teams and jobs are unique. And ideally, you've been thinking throughout this presentation, wow, this is valuable information. Michelle's an amazing speaker, very funny. But how do I solve this problem for myself? Well, now's your time to answer questions. I put some prompts at the top. And then as a reminder, here are all the topics we discussed today. Look at all the stuff we got done in, in 40 minutes. Um, if we run out of time today, feel free to find me around the conference or reach out on LinkedIn. Just make sure to add a message or I'll think you're a robot and I will not accept. Thank you. So, ready for questions. Any questions? If you could go up to the microphone, please. Thank you so much for a lovely talk. Uh, so, you know, as a team, um, I specifically like talking about success statements. It's very interesting that you mentioned that, you know, how you should be able to follow that structure. Uh, I lead a team. And I think one of the biggest struggles as a lead, uh, as a lead when, especially when you're doing individual development plans or, you know, uh, and the like, it's very difficult for individuals or, uh, to really you know, appreciate the work that they have done. It's very difficult for them to recount their success. And no matter uh, like the project list you provide, or oh, you worked on this project, why don't you talk about this, you know, accomplishment? How would you recommend just um, inspiring or providing the right resources to get them to do everything themselves so that you don't have to have so much involvement, not because it's work, but you know, empowering them to be able to tell their full story and not diminishing the work that they did because there can always be that lost in translation. 
Absolutely. So I'm going to tell you a story how the success statement started because I think that'll help you. So this was like 10 years ago. It was my first entry level job. My boss inherited this team of like 40 people and she went to this meeting with the vice president and he was like, what does your team do? She's like, oh, they do so much. They're so important. He's like, but like what exactly? And he, she didn't have that ready. So he's like, I don't think your team does much. I think you can do it with 30 people. And like, it was very unclear how like important the team was. So she was like, oh God, for the next meeting, I got to be ready to go with all this stuff. So she started by like being really on top of us and explaining like the two levels. One is you have to do this. Otherwise we're going to be in trouble. So like a little bit of fear. And then on the other side, she did the, like the inspiration for themselves. So like, this is for your career. This is for you. You do this so that you can get better and it'll help you she really helped coach us into, okay, you take the success statement and then you turn that into a brag sheet and you can turn that into a resume and like showing all the steps and really in the beginning, it was about like handholding, especially for people who aren't used to doing this. Um, but then eventually people like get good at it and start doing it. And then on a very silly way, um, we got a piece of candy for every success statement that we did literally like little Milky Way fun size. So like that was really nice at the end of the quarter. I'd get like showered with candy. Um, and then we were all in teams, right? So it was like 40 people, but like five people per team. And whichever team in the most success statement got a pizza party. And like, this sounds like we're kindergartners, but it totally works. Yeah. Like you just like appeal to like the fun. And that's why I really like it. It's just like, it's like a celebration. And then when people start to feel that celebration, they're more inspired to keep doing it. So like after the first one, people were like, oh yeah, we want to have a party every quarter. That's so cool. And then we like show here's all the cool things. So the first time I did it for my team, I kind of did it for them. And I even put together a little presentation with like music. And I was like, oh, look at all the cool movies we worked on because we're at Netflix. Look at all this cool stuff that we did. And everyone was like, oh shit, we work on movies. Like we forgot because we're actually a platform team. So it was just really nice. It's like, so it's a couple of things. It's like the, it's like the carrot and the stick and just seeing what works for your team and what helps motivate them together. And then just like building that culture so that every time a new person came in, that was what they were told right away. They're like, oh, this team does this. So be prepared to get used to doing this once you have set it for the whole team. Thank Can I you. answer your question? Yep. Thank you. Any chance that you will have your slides shared anywhere? Uh, yeah, I will put them on my website when I have a chance. I literally just finished this. So I'm excited that I have slides, really. It <laughs> <laughs> no, this was a great talk. I have to say, even though I have dedicated TPMs on my team, you've given me a lot of really good ideas on how to get my security engineers more engaged with the process um, to be kind of more a part of it instead of just letting the TPMs kind of direct things and do it all. Um, this was a great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I think about it in terms of like, it's like your career too. You can't just like wait around for people to just give you promotions because it's never going to happen, especially if you're a marginalized gender and in a very different in this tech community. Um, so you have to be this very proactive and like, you can't just like get stuff. You have to show your branding. You have to show off. I mean, it sucks you have to do extra work, but it, it will get you further than if you're just like sitting back and letting things happen. And then of course, the next team you'll be on, you might not have a TPM, which is like, no matter how much you beg for it, they won't give you one. So you're like, all right, how do we actually move the team forward without having a project manager? We only have someone that says, you know, 10 levels above, here's the whole product. What can we do? So it's really nice to have those skills for when you need it. Without doing like getting some, you know, massive amount of books or taking a course or anything like that, are there any like books you might recommend, like one or two that, oh, if you just want to get your feet wet and and get better at it, but not have a whole career being a TPM, anything you might recommend? So I haven't actually read any books on project management, so I can't recommend any. I've just been experiencing it. Like I've just been seeing it, what works and not works on the team. And I think that that's actually the perspective I want to come on is that there are plenty of project management books about how to like, I'm sure how to move things along and how to get things to work. But I go from the very simple and the very practical, you know, like that impact effort matrix you can just draw two arrows and you've got a, you know, you've got some planning ready to go and everyone pretty much understands how that works. Um, rather than when I've had a dedicated project manager, they have all these like skills and ideas and things ready to go. And I'm just like, how do I distill that into like the least possible work, but also has like a big impact for our team and like what has worked in the past. Like 
for example, like the team consensus, I see this, I see this happening over and over and over again at like small levels and big levels where people like argue about a solution, like ad nauseum, and then you ask them like, what are you trying to solve? And like no one can answer that question because they're too busy all like in their own. I think everyone's like having a conversation with themselves and like they have all their own ideas and then no one realizes where that meeting time went and nothing has been like concluded. I always like to have, here's, here's the goal we're trying to solve for this meeting. Do we agree that this is the goal? Do we want to solve this? Like first, so everyone's on that same page. And then if someone like rambles and goes off on another tangent, you'd be like, do you think that's going to solve this original goal? Do you remember that original goal? Or did you get like lost in story time? So it's, it's something that just comes up all the time, something I've noticed. So it's more about, less about, uh, I would say like what's been written and what's going on and more just like, here's my practical experience. Here's what I've noticed with people. Here's some practical tips on how to do it. I'm sure there are good books. If anyone wants to recommend any, definitely share with the rest of us. No other questions? Cool. Great talk. Thank you. You again.